Bitcoin, I don't care what the maxi say, Bitcoin's worth what somebody will pay for it. Mark Cuban, the billionaire investor and star of Shark Tank, has just come out and given crypto holders some very good news. You know what the maximum number of Bitcoins out there are going to be, right? 21 million. Mm -hmm. That's it, right? And that's a good thing, but you've got to have people who want to own it and hold it in order for the price to go up. Yeah. And what happened when everybody was buying it, price went up. It's, it's a store of value. It's driven by supply and demand. I think it'll replace a lot of gold holders, people, you know, who in the past have owned gold and because no one owns physical gold. It's really just a digital transaction anyways. And Bitcoin's a better version of that than gold. Yeah. Um, so I think Bitcoin's going to be okay, but where the price is going to go and when it's just supply and demand. What about Ethereum? Ethereum, I like the best. Mark Cuban was until recently one of the most outspoken Bitcoin and cryptocurrency enthusiasts. Although he is positive about quite a few projects in this space, his positivity towards Ethereum outgrew that over all other projects. Cuban attributes this positivity because Ethereum acts as one of the leading smart contract platforms. Recently, he spoke at Coinbase's State of Crypto Summit, talking to hundreds of institutions on the future of crypto. However, what only recently held his attention were the unexploited potentialities of blockchain technology. According to Cuban, smart contracts are going to be what brings about the next large wave of innovation. Cuban also went on to enlighten that the real killer app is one that an end user finds so easy to use that an end is compelled to share the same view, such as a grandmother wanting to use Instagram and Snapchat years after the release of the iPhone. Cuban noted that crypto hasn't yet had its breakthrough, mainstream app. He sees promise in blockchain applications like NFTs for ticketing or digital textbooks, which could revolutionize industries by providing downstream royalties. But he doesn't see as much value for industries without downstream royalties. He brought up how his NBA team, the Dallas Mavericks, began accepting Bitcoin and Dogecoin for tickets and merchandise as far back as 2018, noting that people get used to getting paid in different ways. One of the key themes Cuban discussed was how younger generations like Gen Z and millennials are more comfortable with apps and new technologies, including crypto. He sees this as a major advantage for the adoption of blockchain over traditional banking, which often involves complex regulations and high transaction fees. Cuban also noted that many financial systems are ripe for disruption, with crypto offering potential improvements through blockchain's transparency and efficiency. It's okay, and I've always compared it to gold and, and always said that it was better than gold. You know, when people say gold has intrinsic value, that's ridiculous. The idea that, you know, assigning, we like gold colored jewelry or gold original jewelry, and that's intrinsic value is ridiculous. And so I think for a lot of reasons, then we fast forward to the last, the summer really, and you start to see the value of smart contracts and DeFi in particular and governance. And now you realize whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum, even maybe some other choices, when somebody owns that, they become their own personal banker. And when somebody has that and you can start creating other applications with smart contracts and you get a lot of leverage and there's, that's really changed the game for me. And that's what got me excited. So there's a few things there. I mean, let's talk more about the idea of, is it a currency? Is it a commodity? Is it digital gold? And you know, the original white paper did say an electronic peer to peer cash system. And mm -hmm. so in some ways, the skeptics who say, well, it's not used as cash. They're not wrong that originally it was called cash, but of course, right. technologies evolve, use cases evolve. And you're right, right now, all the big believers, they say it's a store of value, it's digital gold. I guess I'd ask you though, is that as exciting and interesting if it's not something in addition, if it's just an asset that you're buying to hold, and we can talk separately about right. you know the Ethereum applications, but just for Bitcoin, if it's just digital gold, well, it, does that really match up with the original promise? Well, you know, I'm not, I didn't read the white paper. I couldn't tell you all the details of the original promise and I don't really care. Um, what I know is what I know right now. And in, you know, the existing environment, you could use it as collateral. And when you can use it as collateral and you can swap it and where, depending on where you swap it, you can do it efficiently and, and effectively, then your options ex expand. And so because it's, um, it's got a liquid marketplace. You can assign a value to it, not just as a store of value, but to act as collateral for other transactions. Drawing from his years of experience in the tech industry, Cuban sees similarities between the rise of crypto and previous tech booms, but with a crucial difference, community. He emphasized that crypto is driven by its communities, 
where people rally behind tokens like Dogecoin or Bitcoin, often with a shared dream of wealth. This sense of collective aspiration, he argues, strengthens the ecosystem and is something that regulators like the SEC often overlook. Cuban expressed frustration with regulatory hurdles, particularly in the U.S., which he believes stifles innovation. He has urged politicians, including those in the White House, to address these issues and simplify the registration process for crypto businesses. In his view, other countries like Singapore and Japan are already ahead by fostering a more crypto-friendly environment. Mark Cuban believes the regulatory challenges facing the cryptocurrency industry are a unique issue in the U.S., largely due to SEC Chairman Gary Gensler's approach. Cuban argues that Gensler's stance could have serious political repercussions, potentially hurting Joe Biden's chances in the next election. He points out that many Gen Z, Gen X, and millennials own significant amounts of cryptocurrency, and the current difficulty in registering legitimate coins only makes it easier for scam coins to thrive. Cuban emphasizes that the core issue is about enabling broader participation and providing more access to opportunities. This aligns with the American spirit of innovation, where many groundbreaking technological advancements originated in the U.S. He highlights that cryptocurrency should be about giving people more opportunities to be part of the future economy. But when it comes to crypto and blockchain and stuff, how do you feel about that? I, I think it's a, I think a big part of the future. Right. I really, really do. But I think people are looking at the wrong way. Hmm. People get really amped up about um, the price of the, the currency, the cryptocurrencies, right? right? The tokens. And they think that's really what crypto is, but it's not. That's the noise, right? The signal is, if I were going to start a business, how can I use this new technology to give myself a competitive advantage and disrupt an industry? Addressing over 600 institutions and corporations at the event, Cuban urged them to engage with their political representatives. He advised them not to frame the conversation as crypto or bust, but rather to communicate the needs and behaviors of their customers. He also stressed the importance of being aware not only of the benefits of crypto, but also of the challenges that come with it. When discussing cryptocurrency, Mark Cuban stresses the importance of being transparent and honest, rather than relying on hype phrases like, to the moon. While it's easy to criticize figures like Gary Gensler, Cuban believes most people don't fully understand the space, so it's crucial to explain things in simple terms. For some, cryptocurrency is like a collectible, helping them feel part of a community. For others, it's a way to gain access to financial systems or an application that offers real utility, whether that's for insurance, ticketing, or textbooks. He encourages companies to frame crypto in the context of competing applications so people can see that it's about offering something valuable, not just bypassing traditional systems. Cuban also highlights the unique benefits of blockchain technology, such as transparency, smart contract capabilities, and open access. While similar functionalities can be achieved with a regular database, they lack the openness that blockchain provides. Ultimately, Cuban suggests that crypto can serve as a lottery ticket for users, an entry point into new communities, connections, and even future opportunities. Recently, Bitcoin and crypto traders have been advised to expect fireworks this month. Following a warning from BlackRock's CEO about a crazy message from the Federal Reserve, the price of Bitcoin has surged back after falling below $60,000 earlier in the week. This recovery comes as former U.S. President Donald Trump's warnings about China seem to be coming true. The reason I've come to address the Bitcoin community today can be summed up in two very simple words, America first. Because if we don't do it, China's going to be doing, others are going to be doing it. Let's do it and do it right. My vision is for an America that dominates the future. We have the best economy, the highest standard of living, the safest and most beautiful cities. And by the way, when I say safest, our cities are going to hell right now. Our cities are going to hell. We're going to fix our cities. We're going to work with Democrats that have destroyed our cities, but we'll work with them and we're going to get our cities back. We're going to bring our country back. And we really were the freest and the most ambitious, most dynamic nation 
ever to exist on Earth, and we're going to get that back again, because we're not there now. We're a nation in decline. You know it. We know it. Doesn't sound nice. But it's okay, because we're going to bring it back. We're going to bring it back fast. Right now, it's, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing what's happened. Even today, when you look at what we just said, that would never have happened if they respected our country. If we don't embrace crypto and Bitcoin technology, China will, other countries will, they'll dominate. And we cannot let China dominate, they are. Meanwhile, at Tesla's Elon Musk has raised concerns that the US could face bankruptcy due to its spiraling national debt. In response, billionaire investor Mark Cuban has hinted at a plan, once suggested by Trump, to use Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies to pay off the U.S. national debt. This idea was jokingly backed by the so-called Doge Department of Government Efficiency, a playful reference to Musk's involvement. We don't know what Elon would actually do, Cuban said on the All In podcast while discussing how the U.S. might handle its $35 trillion debt. Alongside investors David Friedberg, Kamath Palihapitiya, Jason Calacanis, and David Sachs, Cuban humorously speculated Maybe he'll put Doge in the treasury. Who knows? And that's how we make it all up. In July, Cuban suggested that Silicon Valley's growing support for Trump's 2024 presidential run might be linked to a Bitcoin play. He predicted that if Trump wins, there could be a major Bitcoin price surge. Despite being a vocal Democrat and supporter of Kamala Harris, Cuban acknowledged that Trump's stance on crypto could win him the election, especially given President Joe Biden's opposition to it. Earlier this year, Trump floated the idea of using Bitcoin to address the U.S. debt. He said, crypto is a very interesting thing. Maybe we'll pay off our $35 trillion, hand them a little crypto check, right? We'll hand them a little Bitcoin and wipe out our $35 trillion? Cuban also warned of the high stakes the U.S. faces in the global race for leadership in artificial intelligence, AI. In a recent interview on CNBC, he emphasized, our military dominance... Our place in the world depends on our ability to invest in AI, period, end of story. Whoever wins AI has the best military. There's no question about it. While private companies in the Defense Department are investing in AI, Cuban argued that more needs to be done. He stressed that the U.S.'s geopolitical and financial power depends on the outcome of the AI race. We cannot lose that battle or we lose everything, he said. That defines our currency. It defines how we compete in the world. It defines our military. So investing in that is critical. Different world. Our military dominance, our place in the world, depends on our ability to invest in AI. Period, end of story. Whoever wins AI has the best military. There's no question about it. And private companies, while they obviously invest a lot, the Department of Defense obviously invests a lot, we need to do more. We cannot lose that battle or we lose everything. That de defines our currency. It defines how we compete in, in the world. It defines our military. So investing that is critical. There was a piece out um, just, just recently about that there has not been a manufacturing boom, that there was post-pandemic for a year, but it's been bad. It's been bad for the past two years. The ISM uh, the index has been contracting since 2022, right when the IRA was passed. So there's been no, no, yeah, but Joe, okay, look, there's but, 500. What, but are, are you sure that they, I mean, this was my fear, uh -huh. Solyndra. That's my fear. Yeah, you, picking you, winners you, and losers, yeah. Exactly. Right. Intel. Intel, we decide. Now, Intel can't get out but of now the TSM, no, But TSMC is making, what, five millimeter or three um, nano, whatever yep. it is, chips already. Right. And, that's, and that's needed. That's critical, right? That's critical for U.S. security. But to your point, right? These comments come as Vice President Kamala Harris, backed by Cuban, outlines her economic agenda. During a speech in Pittsburgh, she called for greater investment in industries like semiconductors and clean energy. Cuban praised her focus on AI, stating... You can talk about military all you want, but if we don't have the best AI in the universe, we're in trouble. Venture capital firms in Silicon Valley are also paying more attention to defense technology. Y Combinator recently made its first investment in a weapons manufacturer, Ares Industries, which aims to produce more affordable anti-ship missiles. Meanwhile, companies like Palantir, known for its AI-powered data analysis platforms, are becoming mainstream investments. Former Google CEO Eric Schmidt, along with former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Mark Milley, 
also raised concerns about AI's role in future conflicts. In a joint commentary, they warned that the U.S. is unprepared for the next generation of warfare, where autonomous weapon systems and advanced algorithms will dominate the battlefield. The country needs to reform the structure of its armed forces, Milley and Schmidt wrote. They called for changes in military tactics, leadership, and equipment procurement, emphasizing the need to better train soldiers to operate drones and utilize AI in future combat. Mark Cuban also recently expressed his support for Kamala Harris's approach to the cryptocurrency industry, praising her for addressing digital assets as part of her 2024 campaign. Well, let, let me talk about the process, because I think that's the most port, important element here when it comes to the vice president's tax approach. You know, I've talked to the Biden administration. I've talked to the Trump administration. I've talked to the Obama administration. And I think the Harris administration has been most open. I mean, they've been very clear to me and other business people that, look, we've realized that rich people have to pay their fair share, but we don't have all the answers. So Mark and others, what do you think is the best approach to taxing wealthy people so that they pay their fair share to help contribute to reducing the deficit and we can come up with some new ideas? And let me just tell you, I probably talk to them and I know others do as well three, four times a week about what's the best approach to taxing the wealthy and increasing revenues and cutting costs for that matter. In an interview with Notice, Cuban highlighted Harris's proactive efforts to engage with leaders in the crypto industry, marking a shift from the Biden administration's more stringent regulatory stance. Cuban noted that Harris has been seeking out meetings with key figures in the digital asset space, listening to their concerns. This openness has caught the attention of many in the crypto community, providing a fresh perspective for those who have felt overlooked. While Donald Trump has garnered significant support from the cryptocurrency sector, Cuban believes that Harris's willingness to engage with the industry could win over skeptics. You can't take extreme positions if you want to bring a country together, Cuban said in an October 3rd interview with Farrakh Radio, referring to Trump's strong reactions to the political divisions in the U.S. Cuban's comments come at a time when the cryptocurrency movement is advocating for less government interference. Harris's involvement could signal a potential shift in U.S. crypto policy if she becomes president. Both political parties are recognizing the growing influence of digital assets in American politics this election season. Trump, who was once critical of cryptocurrencies, has since shifted his stance and now supports crypto-friendly policies. On August 29th, Trump unveiled his ambition to make the U.S. the crypto capital of the planet if re-elected through an initiative backed by his sons called World Liberty Financial. In response, Kamala Harris' team has launched the Crypto for Harris project, aiming to engage with the cryptocurrency community and counter Republican outreach. Her team is also working on a pro-crypto policy framework to strengthen Harris's connection with the sector. Who do you want to see win the election out of Trump and Harris and why? Let us know in the comments below.